Kendrick? Kendrick? I'm leaving. No, you ain't shit. You say you love him. I know you don't mean it. I know you irresponsible, selfish. You deny you can't help it. Your trials and tribulations are burden. Everyone felt it. The cat is out the bag. I am not your savior. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. But I don't know. I'm no mortal man. Maybe I'm just another nigga. There's something that you're taught as a man when you're growing up about your emotions, and it's that you shouldn't acknowledge them. Unless they're helping you go where you need to go, they're not worth giving any attention, they shouldn't be treated as important, and they definitely shouldn't be shared with others. And that is so wrong. And personally, I've never had to deal with that stigma on a deep level. I'm a Christian white kid raised in the suburbs with a pretty great upbringing, and I've never had anything that deep and dark to hide. Kendrick Lamar, on the other hand, he's got the weight of the world on his shoulders. He's supposed to be the guy with the answers, the poetic savior with the key to equality and love and healthy living. And because he's so full of knowledge, he shouldn't ever struggle, right? I don't think so. A wise man once said, with wisdom comes sorrow, and the more knowledge, the more grief. And man, is that true. And on top of that, imagine feeling like you couldn't share any of that grief. Kendrick Lamar has been arguably the main contributor to my cultural awareness growing up. The way he articulates these larger than life struggles of people like him and makes them feel personal is almost like listening to my friend tell me stories of the issues that he's dealing with in his own life. While I've never been able to actually relate, my empathy for people has grown exponentially purely because of Kendrick Lamar and his music. So when he was coming out with Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers after five years of silence, you would imagine I was thrilled. Finally, Kendrick was coming back to talk about COVID, the new world, this pandemic, and all the political and social issues that were going on. He's finally going to fix it. And so with those expectations, you can imagine my initial reaction as soon as I started playing this record. Finally, it's been five years since we got a Kendrick project. I'm so excited. I'm hype. He's going to tell us everything that's wrong with the world. Here we go. I've been going through something. 1,855 days. I've been going through something. Wait. What? Kendrick, you're... You're the savior of hip-hop. You're supposed to tell us how to fix everything. You're the one with the answers. Why are you talking about yourself? Kendrick Lamar makes something very clear to us as listeners from the very beginning of Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. It changes our expectations of what this project will be. Despite the world falling apart more than it seemingly ever has since Damn released, Kendrick won't be rapping about what's going on with our world, He's focusing on his world, and Kendrick's world, it's, it's broken. Huh. Throughout the second half of the song, Kendrick spits two verses that detail the three main unhealthy forms of grieving that he's struggling with on this project, but more specifically this disc. Gaslighting, sex, and flaws in his character. His anger his bitterness. Verse 3 is a coded anecdote about Kendrick having sex with a woman he refers to as Green Eyes, which ended up happening after they seemed to connect over having common loss. While he doesn't outright state regret for what he did, Kendrick seems to provide excuses throughout this verse as for why he, in his words, sexed the pain away. God seems to be ignoring him, and he's dealing with systemic loss that he can't seem to run away from. The final verse focuses on unnecessary materialism. He opens up about buying a Rolex only to never wear it, and buying cars that he never drives. And after he says all this, it's pretty clear how Kendrick processes his grief. But the question remains, how does he cope? Hello, new world, all the boys and girls, 
I got some true stories to tell. N95 is the most popular song on this album, and rightfully so. The 808s that drive the instrumental are infectious. The synthesizer symphony on every refrain is an instant earworm, and Kendrick comes through with one of his best flows to date. However, the track is one of the most significant examples this year of a song's meaning being completely lost inside of its immense popularity. The title of the song is a reference to the N95 face masks that are considered considered the best at protecting the user from COVID. Wait, a mask, protection, the hiding of one's true face, that's what this song is. N95 is a paradox. Kendrick comes off condescending on the song, provocative, condemning others for hiding their true selves through materialism. And yeah, he's right. When he calls out a plethora of different kinds of fake people in the first verse, you can put a face and a name to almost every single thing Kendrick asks the listener to take off. And yet, at the same time, Kendrick himself is completely hiding under something as well. His trauma. He's denying the personal struggles he's dealing with, projecting his flaws onto other people. His provocation in and of itself is a mask. The statement Kendrick is making on this track is one of denial. He's illustrating an unhealthy coping mechanism that he's using to deal with his struggle, and it's much more impactful to be delivered this way. It's actually relatable for the listener to see Kendrick conceal his problems with his ego, to watch him commit the sin of dishonesty and attacking others. I mean, when have we ever seen Kendrick Lamar talk like this? Bitch. Huh. Uh, you ugly as fuck. You out of pocket. Huh. It's contradictory. Kendrick ends the song by asking where are the hypocrites at after spending three minutes spitting lines that make him a hypocrite over and over again. While United in Grief is a potent forward to the subject matter of this project, N95 is where we really learn where Kendrick Lamar is at. And that's broken and grieving and doing everything he can to run away from his own problem. After just two songs, the mental state, the character portrayal of Kendrick on this album is already clear. I came into this project expecting Kendrick to speak the truth, to give us solutions, to save the world, but this isn't a Kendrick Lamar that can do that. N95 is riddled with contradictions of things that Kendrick has said in the past, or even that he says on this very project. After just condemning himself on the intro for being materialistic and covering himself in expensive watches and clothes, at the end of the first verse, he exposes other people for doing the same thing. He explains that the world is the way it is because the prophets left, and they're silent, when Kendrick himself has just spent the last five years in solitude despite calling himself the prophet of hip-hop. But most importantly, he's throwing out insults and disrespectful comments when his entire discography thus far has been about love and positivity and contributing to the world in a good way. And with all of that said, all of these contradictions aren't meant to be taken at face value or as something that Kendrick actually believes. It's a coping mechanism. And sure, it's unhealthy, but it's something. This false reality, this flimsy front, it shows us a Kendrick Lamar that can't help anyone. He's become so broken that even when he tries, even when he wants to speak the truth to point out our flaws, he no longer comes across as poetic and graceful. He's angry, bitter. But is that his fault? No, it's it's not. I'm not the only stepper here. Everyone wants me to be this way, but but look at yourself. You're not doing anything. You're not helping anyone. You're you're just like me. You're a killer. You're a fake. But why is everyone blaming me? Everyone's a killer. It's not me. It's not my fault. Trust me, we're all at f What the Eight billion people on earth, silent murderers, non-profits, preachers in church, crooks and burglars. Woo! After realizing that you've become a hypocrite and a persecutionist, there are two ways you can go. Project your insecurity onto others in order to lift yourself back up in the process, or open up and work past your grief. Kendrick isn't quite ready to make the mature choice yet, so Worldwide Steppers is a self-justification of his flaws as he calls out everyone else for being just as bad as he is. The track dissects what a killer truly is in the context of our society, and of course it doesn't include Kendrick, and this track sounds... well, let's just rewind a bit. 
The first time I fucked a white bitch, I was 16 at the Palisades. Kendrick goes into a bit of detail on this track regarding his struggle with lust, but not in a way that's gonna heal him. He claims that having sex with white women is retribution and earned because of the way white people oppressed Kendrick's ancestors in the past. This is all delivered through the concept of everyone around Kendrick being a killer, which is to say that he's not doing anything wrong because at least his sex addiction is an eye for an eye. The noble person that goes to work and pray like they poster, slaughter people too, your murder's just a bit slower. It's not just me, you're all just as bad. I'm Mr. Morale, I'm the good guy, but all of you big steppers, you're worldwide. And me? I'm just a diehard. I hope I'm not too late to set my demon straight. I know I made you wait. This is the first show of genuine emotion that we see from Kendrick on this project, and even though it only scratches the surface of vulnerability, it's a personal favorite because it's a rare moment of doubt and insecurity for him. There's a double entendre in the very concept of this track, as Kendrick is simultaneously addressing his fiance Whitney as well as his fans. On the chorus, he hopes that he's not too late, as he's hoping his audience will stick around despite his shortcomings. This applies to his fans because of the five years of silence from Kendrick, and for Whitney as well because of his sex addiction. And the end of the first verse is one of the most personally striking things that Kendrick has ever said on record for me. We all got enough to lie about. My truth too complicated to hide now. Can I open up? Is it safe or not? I'm afraid a little you relate or not. Have faith a little how might take my time. Ain't no saving face this time. And now it all makes sense. Kendrick's front, his dishonesty, his gaslighting attempts to convince us that he's okay, it's all because of his insecurities. He's worried that we won't love him, that all the credibility he's built up will go away, that everyone will turn around and hate him for what he's doing, and isn't that what it's always like? It's so hard to tell others how you feel, to say, I'm not who you think I am, I'm a failure, I need help, please. And I guess that I just thought, I thought that Kendrick would be different. But at the end of the day, isn't that the point of the song? But I don't know. I'm no mortal man. Maybe I'm just another nigga. He's been worried about this for years now. Finally showing us that he's not perfect being open to criticisms for possibly the first time in his career. So he opens up with something that's fairly easy, that's relatable, that's inoffensive in terms of justifying a lack of character, at least. Domestic abuse. I come from a generation of home invasions, and I got daddy issues, that's on me. Every time the four was that told me, them habits buried deep, that men knew a lot, but not enough to keep me past them streets. My life is a plot, twisted from directions that I can't see. Daddy issues, fall across my head, told me bumper foul, I'm teary-eyed. Father Time is one of the most popular songs on this project, which is probably because of its healthy piano chords and powerful snares, along with one of Sampa's best features to round out the song's appeal. And in Kendrick's first attempt at actually opening up, he talks about the false realities that his father taught him, and how it's led to this toxic masculinity that he struggles with now. This track is such a powerful bite to it, the lines have this poignant effect on impact. Some of my favorite lines are when he writes, that man knew a lot but not enough to keep me off the streets, or his mama died and I asked him why he's going back to work so soon, his first reply was son, that's life, the bills don't have a silver spoon. Or maybe even, I love my father for telling me to take off the gloves because everything he didn't want was everything I was. While this track is strongly written and eloquently delivered, being placed at this point in the track list makes it feel emotionally inauthentic. It's a first attempt a lie created by Kendrick as a false explanation of his mental struggle because it's easy. Nobody hears Father Time and thinks to blame Kendrick for the turmoil that he's suffered. It's a widely accepted concept at this point that toxic masculinity is a common issue in his demographic. In order to hide his deeper and darker secrets, Kendrick uses his father's shortcomings as a way of convincing his audience that his struggles are only that deep. But of course, that's not really the case, and despite Kendrick's desire to convince us that he has a rich spirit, all his efforts to control his problems are only making them worse. Taking my baby to school, then I pray for the most ethereal and swagger-induced track on this disc sees Kendrick rapping about his solution, his weird flex on how he deals with the world, 
isolation. The quote-unquote rich spirit that the title refers to is the balance that Kendrick raps about on the chorus, making a conscious effort to abstain from the opinion of the masses to keep himself in check. Ooh, rich nigga, broke phone. Trying to keep the balance, I'm staying strong. Stop playing with me for a turn to a song. Stop playing with me for a turn to a song. He's in a way trying to draw a parallel to fasting, whether it's from the internet, from people, from all outside influences. He fasts in order to have a rich spirit. And you know what? Kendrick is doing exactly what any normal person would do to try and work through his mental health issues, but that doesn't make it right. I've done this wanting to stop associating with everyone so that you can get on your high horse, put down the phone, put down the social media, focus on yourself, your own growth. That's the only way that you can finally get better. You need to choose growth over company. That's how you get a rich spirit, right? Oh, I've done that. And you know what? It's completely victim to the toxic masculinity that Kendrick learned from his dad to do it yourself, to burn all your bridges, to cut everyone off that'll get you a rich spirit. I don't know where that narrative came from or why I believed it or why so many others do, but it's not correct. It won't make you better. It'll make you angry and frustrated and insecure until eventually you take it out on everyone around you. So that way we can cry together. But wait, first, we missed something. I learned in trapping in the business, smart people making horrible decisions, you know? Is that Kodak Black? Wait, why would Kendrick Lamar work with a scumbag like that? Kodak is the worst. He's a rapist. He's irredeemable. Kendrick, he doesn't deserve- Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this video, and I want to interject quickly just to tell you guys that I really love doing this. And I hope that you're enjoying my content at least a little bit. And if you are, it would really help this channel out if you would like or subscribe. I've noticed that the only videos that actually get picked up by the YouTube algorithm and get attention are the ones where you guys click the like button when you first watch it. So that's the main key to improving my channel and growing it. So if you guys are enjoying, that is the number one way to help me out. And also, I know you guys have seen the YouTubers who say, well, only a certain percent of these people who watch my videos are subscribed, but I actually went and I looked at the statistics for my channel the other day, and 95% of my watch time are from people who aren't subscribed to my channel, and that number's really low. So bottom line is like and subscribe. If you don't want to do it for anything else, do it for me. I appreciate it. Back to our regularly scheduled programming. I swear I'm tired of these emotional ass or grateful ass Get bitches. Unstable ass, confrontational ass, dumb bitches. I don't think that I need to talk much about this song. It's literally a toxic fight. And it's actually hard to listen to. And despite the fact that I could talk about this fight and the content itself for hours, I'm more interested in what happens afterward. After this disgusting show of hate for each other, Kendrick and Taylor Page end the song by having sex. And it's hard to figure out exactly what this represents until we hear this. Stop tap dancing around the conversation. <laughs> What? Wait, what? Tap dancing? Call that black. Okay, Lama. Every time that we hear tap dancing on this disc, it represents Kendrick's biggest flaw the struggle of being a diehard. Regardless of whether he sounds like he's opening up, being vulnerable about his grief, showing us his personal growth, he's just avoiding the true problem. And that is an imperative piece of context for this record, because when we view these songs through the lens of their subject matter serving as a distraction, it adds an entire new layer of depth to the toxicity of Kendrick Lamar and his character. Worldwide Steppers, Father Time, the transition into Rich Spirit, and of course we don't cry together, all these songs seem to have this productive subject matter that Kendrick is approaching with a good attitude, but they're all projections. 
their false reality to cover up his deeper flaws. Worldwide Steppers calls out the infrastructure of our support systems and how they're actually hurting the people they claim to serve. Father Time illustrates the toxic masculinity and destructive tendencies that Kendrick and so many others have learned from their fathers. And of course, Rich Spirit is preaching self-harmony, disconnecting from the broader world around you and focusing on yourself. And there aren't any real indications of Kendrick's imperfect mindset inside of these songs themselves until we get to We Cry Together. And that's why the song is such a fascinating narrative twist. It's unclear whether Kendrick is just making a statement on what happens in society as a whole, or writing a song about his own experience, or even a little bit of both. And I don't think that it's fair to assume, just based off the context of this project, especially since the most important thing is already clear to us. Kendrick opens up with commentary on toxic relationships, only to hide yet again from his own emotions. After spending an entire disc doing this and finally being confronted, it seems like things are finally opening up on the last track. Purple Hearts are an award given by the US military to those who have been injured or wounded in battle, a decoration to commemorate pain, and so Kendrick uses this song to finally acknowledge and confront his trauma. It's one of the prettiest and most glamorous instrumentals that Kendrick has ever employed on one of his songs, which seems indicative of the fact that things are finally starting to look up for his mental state. In the outro of this disc, Kendrick is recommitting, whether it's to his relationships, or to his vulnerability, or to being a prophet sent by God, he's here for it once more. But shut the fuck up when you hear love talk. The final message that disc 1 leaves us with is simple. Love is the only way to exceed our emotional pain, to receive our purple hearts. Ghostface's verse at the end is a climactic proclamation that love will heal all, and it's God's way to success, whether that's existential or here and now. But is Kendrick really doing that? Does he believe in himself? I mean, look at everything on this project, he's lied over and over, so why would we believe him now? Unfortunately, after an emotional and heartbreaking trek through nine songs, we're left with more questions than answers. Why is Kodak Black on this album? Why is Kendrick struggling so much to open up? Where is the profound social commentary that we've come to expect from him? These are all questions that we're going to discuss next week in part two out of three, which will focus on disc two of this project. But first, there's somebody that needs to forgive Kendrick. You texted me at two o'clock in the morning. I feel like I'm fallen. Why do you feel that way? Life. <laughs> 